great. Thank you so much uh, to Michelle and Dish for having me here. It is such an honor and a pleasure. You know, they keep thanking me for being here, but, you know, it's just a quick drive down, and I'd love sharing about my story and talking more about, you know, how I was able to find my passion in tech. But, you know, without, you know, areas and platforms such as Dish in which to share my story, none of this would have been possible. So a huge t thank you to Michelle first. So we'll just give you a clap for a round. <laughs> Sorry. technical difficulties. <laughs> so, you know, um, I chose like more of an outdoorsy theme for my presentation because, you know, you know, we're from Colorado, so obviously we're all inclined to ski and hike and, you know, like water, <laughs> do all these water like activities and, you know, like water rafting. So obviously I chose this really awesome like slide. So if you keep seeing like all these great photos of nature, it's just because I wanted to inter intercalate that into the theme of, you know, being able to, and I guess that like, I should have taken the chance to introduce really what Never Again Tech is. I mean, you know, it's it's written on these bio cards, but I'm not sure if you guys actually read it. But um, basically, Never Again Tech is a platform that I created with around 200 girls around the nation to use predictive analytics to stop mass shootings. So, you know, coming from Colorado, we've been really severely impacted by Columbine and the Aurora shooting. And, you know, some of my friends' friends have been, you know, directly victimized by these shootings. And I wanted to always took, take what I knew best, which is technology and use it in a way that's past just, you know, posting condolences or, you know, sorry to the victims. You know, I feel like this younger generation and the generation that's about to come over and come and take over the world has a, bi a bigger responsibility than that. So, you know, taking what, you know, I know best, which is artificial intelligence and predictive analytics and seeing what factors can we research that are most known to contribute to mass shootings and how we can we apply different AI algorithms to them to make sure that, you know, you know, we can, not necessarily to prevent the next mass shooting because it's so random, but to get an idea of like, you know, what constitutes it and how schools can be more safe. And you know, how we can kind of build a more, you know, neutral, you know, not necessarily biased by politics um, objective to this, uh, to this environment, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, great, awesome, that's awesome too. So, you know, the next slide. So basically, I kind of wanted to take the chance and first introduce what my personal philosophy is. So, you know, throughout, you know, building this platform and other platforms, I've had my deal, um, my fair share of hardships and successes. It's kind of like a roller coaster ride. And, you know, what you got to do is what I really think are the, these big steps right here. So one of the first is to, you know, take the risk or lose the chance. So, you know, oftentimes when I think of, you know, how I was able to get to this area uh, position, you know, only as a 17 year old, you know, p oftentimes people think that's way too young to be building these kind of platforms or to be, you know, really going out in the world and tackling these kind of issues. I think, you know, the best thing to do is take the risk. You never know until it doesn't work out. And by then, it's only like something that didn't work out. You at least got to explore the opportunity of taking the risk, whether it's academically, socially, or, you know, even in technology. So that's really one of the biggest, um, you know, I guess areas that really inspire me to go every day <laughs> and, you know, get on the grind. Um, the other thing is grit. So I know a lot of people talk about perseverance and resilience, and but for me, I think those words sound kind of cliche. I think the word grit, and there's been so many TED Talks about this and, you know, presentations, grit is defined as, you know, the ability to stick, stay true to yourself and not be, you know, wavered by anything that's discouraging in the slightest. And so I found a great quote that represents that, saying, the fire in me burned brighter than the fire, fire around me. And that's something I tend to keep in mind on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, creativity, perceiving connections, and more importantly, having fun with these projects. So when I talk about perceiving connections, being able to correlate, you know, technology and, poli and politics, or technology and social causes, you know, oftentimes we're limited to these these like, you know, black or white areas, you know, technology is only used for this purpose. Or, you know, we can't involve that with, you know, social areas. But, you know, I tend to disagree because the only way we find like true innovation and, you know, 
a really actual real ability to impact the world is by you know perceiving the connections between the fields and collaborating with everyone and you know I guess that throughout my journey one of the biggest thing is like when people tell me that something is impossible that just motivates me to do it you know you know oftentimes with like either because of my like you know gender the fact that I'm a, I'm a girl in STEM or, the, or my age when people tell me something is impossible that just motivates me to get out there and do it because you know who are they to tell me that I can't do it you know I know my own passion and I know my strengths and you know I definitely think I can surpass any obstacles that come my way so that's kind of more about my personal philosophy so my beginnings you know how I got into technology both through the AI side and the cybersecurity side so <laughs> the funny story about how I got into cybersecurity is actually my laptop was hacked my freshman year so you know and you know me being the naive <laughs> innocent <laughs> high schooler that I was I decided to you know pay it was a ransomware attack so they asked for two hundred dollars for me to get all my files back on like you know homework that I was doing on the last minute so obviously in the time of desperation and stress I went out and I paid <laughs> they paid the money unfortunately for me and as a lesson to not procrastinate I wasn't actually able to <laughs> uh, to um, retrieve those files. The hackers that were originally from actually Switzerland, they uh, you know you know they took the money and they left. And I remember being so scared and feeling daunted by this inf by the fact that you know someone halfway across the world, someone I didn't even know, had access to my information. So I then made it my personal mission to make sure that no one else you know regardless of age you know where they're from should feel this kind of daunting helpless feeling especially in regards to cybersecurity. so that led me to com uh, you know compete in numerous like information security competitions and participate in like amazing internships i recently came back from stanford as a cybersecurity intern and so i had the opportunity to do amazing inter uh, amazing work and uh, projects with people who are a lot older than me but you know, it was really my first eye-opening, <laughs> like, you know, dipping my toe into the water of this wonderful world of cybersecurity. And so, well, uh, and that was in one area. So I created Never Again Tech. I already gave you kind of the gist of it. When I saw in Emma Gonzalez of the, uh, you know, March for Our Lives movement talk about, you know, we call BS. We call BS on the senators, all the people who just, you know, want us to, like, you know, just sit down and not do anything about such a dire social circumstance. So when I was so inspired by, you know, he's such a badass inspiration that I decided to take, you know, my team. And, you know, it was not even a co coincidence that over 200 girls decided to participate. This is an initiative led by an almost all girls, you know, coding team. And, you know, from there, I didn't even expect in my wildest dreams, but I was able to be for, uh, featured on Forbes, uh, Amy Puller Smart Girls. You know, there is a USA Today article coming probably, I think, in the next couple of hours in the Smithsonian. So, you know, a little more about the obstacles that I've faced. So, you know, a little bit of a story time. So when I first started, I competed in my high school and there was a you know, competition called Cyber Patriots. So if for those of you who don't know, it's basically an in initiative led by the Air Force to get all teenagers interested in you know, defending our resources. So you know, there's, uh, the team consists of you know, like a lot of uh, like different areas. So you know, one person who's doing all the infiltrating into the system, one person who's doing all the defending of the system, and all the other people, are, like basically all of us have to do some kind of contribution to the administrative work. So documenting our process, and you know, s just showing the, the people at the Air Force how we did each step. So you know, it was actually me and this other girl in a team of almost like six to seven boys. And the worst part of, I just remember this so clearly, like it, was, it could happen yesterday, but um, basically the guys were like, you know what, you know, you're girls, you don't, you don't really need to be bugged by all of this. Why don't you just do the administrative work while the rest of us actually work on the infiltration of the system? And I'm sure you guys could imagine my heartbreak. You know, it's like I felt like my you know, entire world was shattered in just a moment. A, that you know, someone else doubted my abilities and that you know, they didn't think that you know, me or that other girl could actually do the same, thing that same things that they were doing. We all had the same level of education you know, in fact, me and the other girl came in oftentimes more than the guys to work in on these systems, you know, spending our Saturdays and Sundays there and spending like almost like two or three hours after school just to work on this. 
so, you know, that really was heart shattering because, you know, not only is it that someone else didn't believe it, but, you know, hearing it over and over again led me to doubt my own abilities. You know, what if I really am not good enough to be on this, like, infiltration side and, you know, really be at the hacking area? So, you know, from there, I decided I have two options. One, I can, you know, conform to these stigmas. I can let them, you know, let them influence me and, you know, tell me that I'm not good enough to actually be doing the technical stuff. Or I have another option. I can create my own team with me and the other girl. We can do all the work. We can spend a lot more time and passion into it. And we can eventually beat them, which we actually ended up doing. At the state competition, we ended up uh, achieving gold tier and they reached silver tier. But you know, my entire, that entire team of like, you know, theme of redemption and you know, feeling better doesn't, wasn't necessarily why I decided to do that. I wanted to do that because you know, I wanted to show all those other little girls out there that you know, eventually if you keep believing in something and you're not letting imp the impossibility of something limit you, that you're actually able to do a lot better than you could have ever dreamed. So, you know, I think that one of the biggest things I could really derive from this situation is, you know, don't ever let anyone, you know, tell you what you can or cannot do. If you believe it enough in your heart, eventually you will be able to do it. And without having girls as our support system or having allies, I don't think this would have been possible. So, you know, I made eye contact with Ms. Sheldar because, you know, it's so important to have mentors and inspirations, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So the other thing was I pitched Never Again Tech a couple of weeks ago at Stanford. It was a sta uh, startup pitch day. And you know it was one of the most intimidating like VC experiences I could have ever had. So while we were all presenting you know, our ideas, I saw that most of the startups, which are obviously brilliant, that definitely no like, you know, shade towards them, they were really presenting on like, this technical I level. You know, an AI bot that can like, you know, parse the language that happens in meetings and automatically take down notes. Or, and it's called, um, and, and th that's called Fireflies AI. It was an amazing company. One of my biggest mentors is actually the CTO of it. You know, and basically a lot of different AI companies. But I realized Never Again Tech was the only like, you know, startup or you know, pseudo startup that was focused on using AI for a social cause. You know, oftentimes I think way back, way out in California, the Silicon Valley mindset is it's really a rat race, you know, with people like you know, one after the other, different like small variations to the same idea of let's use technology to make people's lives easier. But I don't think, what I fail to think, what I think that they fail to understand is you know, if we have something so great, we should harness it to help people. Not only for like the purpose of getting a profit or you know, making your startup get onto the Forbes list, but rather you know, use it to help th the everyday American. You know? It's not, I feel like you know, part of the reason why I'm so glad Never Against Tech started in Colorado is because, because we're, when we're from the Midwest, we have a different perspective on everything. It isn't, it isn't, we're not living in our own bubble. We've seen the true, pers true areas of how like, you know, life can change in just an instant. So I was really proud of that. But when I looked at all the, pitcher, uh, the other people who were pitching their startups, they were all like old white males. And you know, obviously I was a little daunted, but you know, <laughs> what the thing is like, I forgot to bring my laptop being the person that I am. And you know, I just remember the kind of derogatory tone that they took on when they were saying, oh, you didn't bring your laptop? How do you even expect to do this? But again, you know, a heart shattering moment. I felt like my heart race and you know, my breathing was like getting really fast. I was hyperventilating that, man. And I just discovered that they were actually VC, like investors in the audience. But at the end of the day, I went back and thought about my own core philosophy. The fact that the fire in me burned brighter than the fighter, fire around me. And you know, I'm doing this for those little girls who don't think that they can do it or are they're, they're kind of being pressured by society into thinking that they're not good enough. And I went up there and presented. And so out of all the startups that are pitched, I think Never Again Tech got the most attention. Because not only are we doing this as like a for-profit startup million dollar investment, we're doing it to, at the end of the day to save people's lives. So that was one of the like, you know, obstacles that I eventually overcame. And you know, going back to the young girls that you know, I keep you know, referencing. So at Regis University, I was able to talk to 
uh, this group about you know getting girls into cybersecurity. So you know the, the key to know goes fine, and eventually we have like you know some question and answers. So this young girl comes up to the stage, you know, she has like these beautiful blue eyes, and she's actually pretty young for this kind of situation. I think she's only 10 or 11. She comes up and tells me, you know, my family website where uh, we all get our like the way we make a living is through our family restaurant, and so th our website though was hacked and turned into a site of pornography. And she could, you could tell how like you know impacted she was because you know it's their only way of <laughs> income. It's a really small family restaurant, and you know they don't deserve this. But you know instead of letting that you know dictate how she reacts or you know letting that bring her down, she said, right, and I can remember this so clearly. She says, I don't want to make sure this happens to me or anybody else again. How can I do that? And automatically it got like goosebumps on my arm. And I was like, this is really what it's about. You know, using my work and in to encourage the next generation of girls in STEM, to encourage the next pioneers in STEM. So when she said that, I automatically knew that she would be one of those life-changing girls. And I have so much, I had so much more opportunities to, you know, talk to these kind of girls. So one of my biggest passions outside of just knowing about cybersecurity is getting other girls involved. Because at the end of the day, cybersecurity is a tool. It's one of the biggest, most important, you know, vulnerabilities yet strengths of technology. So when we really include girls in it, they bring a different perspective. And I think that's very important. So yeah, going along more with the theme, if we look at the alarming lack of women in STEM, we see that not only is there a lack of women, there's a lack of minority representation too. You know, if you see this chart, and I think this was published by the National Center for Women in Technology, so one out of the 10, you know, dean or associate dean positions in computer science is held by a woman. You know, and not only that, one of the biggest things, and this was from Clemson University, they, did, they conducted a study there. You know, there's assistant professors who left Clemson be, uh, were 56% women. And you know, graduates eligible for faculty positions, for example. You know, 15% were minority women, 53% were women itself. And, you know, again, like applicants for all assistant professor positions, only 23% were women. So, you know, this is a really dire problem. And if you s look online and you search up, you know, why are women discouraged from being STEM? The fact that they, are, they get into STEM at their early ages with such a big interest, but, you know, suddenly they dwindle off. Not all the computer science graduates are not even half women, or you know, all the people who are currently going into the technological fields, there's a real dire lack of women. And you know, this is one of the problems that I was faced with for a long time. You know, how can I find other people like me who want to encourage the next generation? And I was thinking about it, and I think the biggest solution that I came up with along with a team of, uh, with a team of girls is you know we have to start early. We have to start showing them that there are women who are successful in this field, who have overcame their own obstacles, and that they were eventually able to prosper. And with that, if we can inspire young girls to get into STEM, because they've seen their role models, they have like an, a huge array of inspirations, they'll be, they'll be able to you know, get really into the field too. And you know, this really echoes what one of the projects I did, so I traveled to Uganda um, as a part of Global Livingston Institute to create a workshop for girls in Uganda and Rwanda. And so one of the best things that I've like ever known is, I was basically doing this like, you know, elephant toothpaste workshop where we use like hydrogen peroxide and <laughs> baking soda to create these huge awesome fountains. And while I was doing that, you know, the, these girls were enthralled by it, you know? Not only was it a fun ex experiment, it was an experiment that they've never seen before. And you know, the best part was that we all started dancing. So if you guys don't know, I practice classical Indian dance in Bollywood. And they actually, in Uganda, they do this very traditional box dance with a lot of jumping and powerful steps. So while we were doing all of that, like I realized the innate connection that we have. You know, I may be, you know, older and go to school in the United States and, you know, have had a lot different experiences than the girls there. But eventually, when we all came together at the end of the session, we talked about how we do all face 
stigmas and boundaries in our different ways. One of the things is one of the girls there is developing a way to, find, to get clean water from these jerry cans directly to her house by using an automated, uh, you know, an automated form of system with uh, bicycles. So she was so, like her eyes lit up when she was talking about it. And, but she said, you know, my dad, my brothers, and all the other people in the village, villages are discouraging me not to do it and focus more on like, you know, helping out the home. Which I told her, that's not gonna happen. You and I and all the other girls here, we're going to focus on building that system. Because at, at the end of the day, we're all focused on developing society, our own communities. And yes, we have like, you know, faced our own types of like, you know, stigmatization, but because we're all together and because we all inherently are connected with each other, we can, you know, t you know, bring our hands together and we can overcome these boundaries. And this really was like another, uh, this really echoed with me because when I was, uh, I didn't get the chance to visit the school in Rwanda, but as you might know, there's a, there was a genocide in Rwanda. So this academy called Sunrise Academy took all the daughters of the, you know, rape survivors of the you know people <laughs> daughters who have made it through the murders of their own like mothers and <laughs> grandmothers and their parents and they are some of the smartest people I've ever known while I was conducting a Skype session with them I asked them what do you know about cybersecurity and they immediately said firewalls <laughs> intrusion detection intrusion prevention email security and I was astounded but I asked them how did you even how do you know about all of these very technical terms she said you know, we got one donation of a book, right? And you know, but we, and it was only a simple book and it was like, you know, CIS is key, how to get into security. But they all read it, they highlighted it, they quizzed each other, and they actually know more about cybersecurity than a security professional. So this really led me to think, if they could do that with just one simple book, imagine what they could do with all this training, all these resources. So, you know, we're currently looking at ways to donate to them you know, more books, more laptops, you know, some like, you know, sanitized areas where they can actually test their skills. So that's one of the really most impactful moments of my life. And so one of the key ingredients I feel to a great, you know, a successful story in STEM as a girl is mentors. So, you know, these trailblazers have showed me that because of their, avail their ability to you know, surpass all, all these obstacles, they set an amazing precedent of standing up for what is right. So I will go from the bottom. So my mom is here, as, and she's like one of my biggest role models and inspirations. This picture was actually taken. So that's my grandma, mom, and my mo uh, me and my mom. And you know, it's like three generations of women. So one of the best things about my mom is she holds a very powerful position, you know, CIO of Colorado. But she doesn't, she still is able to hold on to her culture and the traditions that she came here with. You know, as a, because like, you know, we're, we're Indian. <laughs> My mom, she'll be taking calls with the governor of, C Governor Hickenlooper, and she'll be like, you know, c helping prepare one of like my favorite Indian dishes. You know, she's like talking on a meeting, you know, we need to implement this. And she's like, Shreya, do you have the onions? <laughs> so, so, you know, it's one of the best things being able to see her because, you know, as one of the first women of color, the first Indian woman on the cabinet, she showed me that not only, like, you know, to stay true to your roots, the fact that, you know, you don't need to let go of what inherently makes you an individual to get into these great positions to really explore your passion in technology. And so she combined with my grandma, who's also one of the strongest women I've ever met, she re they really inspire me to, you know, get out there, but also really inherently hold on to my culture and my traditions. So up here is Debbie <laughs> Blythe. She's one of my awesome mentors. Uh, she uh, is the CISO of Colorado. When I first got interested into cybersecurity, she literally gave me an entire library of books. And for this, till this day, I have not returned it to her. So that's something I should probably get on. <laughs> <laughs> but she let me, uh, she was the one who encouraged me to join women in security and privacy. T she took me to all these events herself because she, she told me that she found something in her that she also saw in, that found something in me that she also had herself. So she has one of the most difficult jobs in the world, you know, protecting the security for the entire state. The state gets almost one million attacks a day. So what she really led me to understand is 
you know, security isn't inherently a technical thing, you know. Women, one of the biggest strengths that women have, one of the assets that they provide, is their ability to, you know, tap into their creative um, side, their more emotional side to understand the aspects of security. So she really led me to understand the psychology behind hacking. You know, why do people hack? What do they derive from it? And a perspective that I feel like, you know, women really bring to the table. And up there is me and uh, Lauren Anderson. She's a former FBI agent who is now working on making sure uh, on, you know, sexual harassment in, you know, third world countries. She is probably one of the most badass people I've ever met. So when she was, she was stationed in Libya, uh, Somalia, and all these like 30 different countries. And, you know, instead of choosing to really pursue her passion in the FBI, which is obviously something great, she decided to, like, because she spent so much time there observing those, she really is now focused on, you know, gender development in these areas, which I think is super amazing because, you know, she went from a really big position to an even greater position that impacts a lot more people. And so I actually worked with her on Safe City, so providing the security for an organization that, you know, documents and charts and uses predictive analytics to find, like, hotspots for sexual harassment in India, Brazil, and the United States. So in light of, you know, all these movements with Me Too, I think we oftentimes forget to really use our vision to understand that it actually happens in different countries too. And they have a lot less resources to be able to vocalize that. So I really think that she's also one of my biggest influences and inspirations. So, you know, I talked a lot more about, you know, my experiences as a girl in technology, but now I kind of want to get into Never Again Tech. And there, there's definitely time for, you know, uh, questions after this. So I guess the main mission of Never Again Tech is, you know, conducting comprehensive research to identify the most common factors that contribute to mass shootings. So when we look at this, we, we analyze it from dis different areas. So for the past, like, you know, we define a mass shooting as a shooting in which four or more people are purposely injured or killed, and this is def as defined by the CDC. So, you know, one of the things is we look into, you know, all the mass shootings that happened in the last 50 years. We understand the socioeconomic status of the perpetrator, the target motive, the type of firearm, the firearm policy in the state, prevalence of, the me of mental illness in the per perpetrator, the number of victims, if, we had if he, or he or she actually had military experience, and if it was a serial or spree killing. So one of the biggest things that you know, I cannot emphasize enough is this is a completely nonpartisan effort. This isn't about being pro-Second Amendment, con-Second Amendment, about, uh, about you know, completely limiting guns. It's about understanding why does this happen? You know, why are people going out there and killing our innocent babies, with even with Sandy Hook? You know, I, we're trying to use technology to get a better understanding and awareness of these, of these really daunting incidents. So, based on all of this, we're compiling an extensive data set among all these resources. So, not only are we doing our own data, uh, we're doing our own research, we're looking at Mother Jones, the CDC, Stanford Mass Shooting Library, Kaggle, and Gun Violence Archive to compile our data. And I guess the saddest part of this all is the Dickey Amendment was passed in, in 2000, which prevents the government or any government-related organization from conducting uh, research related to mass shootings. So it was, it was passed by the uh, NRA, and it was, it was a basically a rider in a bill. And one of the biggest things is, you know, it kind of restricts funding for these, um, these initiatives. And so that's why the CDC uh, kind of stopped its research. And this thereby led to like Stanford stopping its research after 2013, Mother Jones and Kaggle to also kind of petter off because of, the, uh, because of what happened with the CDC. So with all of this in mind, I realized, you know, it's, it's a really hard effort. You know, oftentimes when you're researching so much into the, like, the deaths and the injuries, it's really heartbreaking. But, you know, one thing I always keep in mind is, you know, we're, we're going to go somewhere with this because when, because this organization, Never Again Tech, is a voluntary effort. We're using all our time, any possible time that we have, outside of school, our jobs. The 200 girls that are involved in this organization are undergraduate, graduate doctors at Harvard, you know, people from all aspects of life. And we're coming together to really understand more than anything which then leads to us for the predictive analytics component. So without getting too technical, <laughs> the artificial intelligence is basically using supervised machine learning, which means k-means clustering, decision trees, 
and a naive Bayesian classifier to, to really be able to tell, okay, what are the hot spots for potential activity? Based on all this research that we've garnered, based on the data that we've seen, can we, cr we're creating an algorithm, you know, really technical mathematical algorithm to see where are the potential hot spots? You know, what, what kind of activities and attributes contribute to, you know, a more likely area of, for shooting? So it's a very extensive uh, process. And you know, we initially, uh, within the two months that were created, we thought we were getting somewhere, you know, because we were using the data that we had and we were doing a simple like trained algorithm on it. But then we realized the research aspect was, you know, was a little faulty. You know, one of the biggest things about this organization is its integrity. We wanna make sure that what research we're doing is respectful of the victims, respectful of the families of the shooters, and more importantly, respectful to all the citizens. So when we realized that our research may be faulty, there was a lot of gaps in the research, we decided to scratch it over and start from the beginning. So we reached out to Stanford. Um, we reached out to Harvard Medi Medicine School. We've also reached out to you know, small business dev um, nonprofit development centers to be able to kind of get, to be able to help us in conducting this research. You know, we want to be able to understand more about what, you know, contributes to this. We don't want to just take simple data without understanding it. We don't want to stigmatize mental health by automatically assuming that it had a really big factor or a really small factor in contributing to mass shootings. So we're looking at all areas. One of the biggest initiatives that we're doing is, you know, we're currently applying for a Facebook deep learning, deep uh, learning grant to be able to see what social media posts indicate, you know, <laughs> indicate these kind of, like trigger warnings for these um, shootings, you know, with the Parkland shooting, uh, Nicholas Cruz, uh, what we failed to do, or what the school d f failed to do, is to recognize the post that he was making, and they thought it, they passed it off as a silly, like you know, non-harmful threat. He all, he posted a lot about, you know, I want to shoot up the school tomorrow, but none of us really did anything because not only were we not able to track the technology behind it, we just disregarded it as something that wasn't important. But we don't want to do make that same mistake again. And you know the the organization is really, really like branched out into multiple areas. So not only are we focusing on the research, the deep learning aspects of it, we're really focused on the social advocacy aspect too, which means participating in the marches, in the national school walkouts, and you know really focusing on the parent organization of March for Our Lives. So here, one of the people I collaborate with actually went to Washington D.C. to tell us a lot more about Never Again Tech, uh, to tell everyone a lot more about Never Again Tech. So since we're so geographically diverse, and <laughs> we're actually like so demographically diverse too, you know, I really understood that, you know, mass shootings have different impacts on different people. But, you know, one of the biggest things is because we're, you know, using, we're, it's basically kind of like an interdisciplinary collaboration. Ta we work with school teachers to find out what, safety implementations can they put into schools during a lockdown drill or during this kind of incidents. We even work with policymakers and senators in understanding is there a way we can you know, come kind of reach a medium with restricting access to guns based on psychological background, based on age. So you know, with all of this, it's a very big initiative and I'm so proud of where it's going. You know, obviously it's a little overwhelming. I think my dark circles can be contributed to that. But you know, at the end of the day, it's about taking a social cause that's prevalent in all of our lives. Because you don't want your friend, your kid, you know, your little brother even, going into school scared of what's gonna happen next. Or going to the grocery store, going to the mall and seeing, and being scared for their lives. We wanna take this powerful technology. I've seen predictive analytics, you know, predict, you know, di <laughs> diabetic retinopathy in the medical side. So why can't we use that same technology for this. So, you know, that's currently where, uh, to talk more about the development phase, you know, it's great getting all this, you know, media attention. I think it's because it's a cause that everyone can relate to, but it's also time to really start the groundwork. So, you know, uh, oftentimes people ask me, what do you, when do you think that this is gonna be done? When can you start implementing it? You know, and I wish I could give them an answer, like, you know, six months, so <laughs> one month, you know? But after we understand the core basics of what contributes to a mass shooting, I think that we can go from there. So I think there's a lot of promise for this project. Obviously there are obstacles. You know, you don't want to stigmatize one community. You don't want to be doing this. But at the end of the day, we're harnessing the power of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics for a cause that's kind of, that's a little mysterious for something that, you know, it's not black and white. 
So that's something that I'm really passionate about. So, you know, that's it for my presentation aspect. I don't know how much time we have left. 15 minutes, great, so right on time. If you guys, before we get into the question and answer, uh, here are all my, here's all my information. You know, feel free to, talk, uh, to reach out, follow me on Twitter, please. I'm trying to get to 300 followers. <laughs> and, um, uh, this is the website, Never Again Tech. It is a little in the development area, but there's an about section where you guys can shoot me just a quick email if you're interested in joining the project or providing your persp perspective or for anything that you want to know about for media. And that's my phone number. Don't text me tonight, please. <laughs> but other than that, it, you know, I'm, it's time for questions. Yeah, and so that's, that's a really great question. I, I want to repeat it to, so everyone can understand. So she, uh, Michelle's basically asking, you know, how can we get more girls in STEM involved, even from like different areas of life? So uh, one of the initiatives that I'm currently working with Stanford on is starting from the elementary and middle school areas. So, you know, DISH and Stanford and all these other tech organizations have a lot of funds that they can allocate towards creating coding workshops or creating or have hosting career fairs where girls can learn more about, you know, what, what you know, fields, what areas they can get into in computer science. So I know that when I was a, a freshman, we had people from uh, Future Business Leaders of America, basically um, women who were working on that and women who were you know, CEOs or like even small business administrators, they came in and talked to us about, you know, what they're doing in their path, how they got there and what steps we can take, what tangible steps we can take. But also I know that, you know, schools, uh, especially in the elementary middle school, it's not that hard to download, you know, um, like Raspberry Pi for beginners. Or, you know, I know a lot of people start with the animation aspects of it. Just being able to bring, our, bring some people from your organization there to you know, host a small co coding workshop to get involved, I think is a great first step. You know, and from there, making sure that you know, your, da uh, your daughters, the girls you know in your life, have access to great internships. You know, the internships that I've done at NCC, State of Colorado, uh, Stanford, I think they really, really help develop my passion. So, you know, just being able to even provide like a small shadow work day, shadow day where you bring your daughters into work and being able to really see how the organization functions is a really great first step for this. Yeah, it's giving me a headache just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I d uh, just to repeat the question, you know, Betsy DeVos basically said we're going to use federal funding to put school, um, to put firearms in schools, you know, kind of echoes when they said to fire, uh, to like arm teachers as well to defend the classrooms. You know, without getting too political, I just think <laughs> it's a pretty bad idea. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that Never Again Tech is trying to do is, like, not only the predictive analytics part, is to help alert and give media uh, get attention using technology through, like, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to let young people know or, you know, interested citizens, directing them towards their senator, the, the, the numbers of their senators. You know, really one of the biggest things that we can do and what we're trying to do is we're partnering with, you know, Youth for America to get more people I registered for, to vote. You know, because we can't directly do anything about Betsy DeVos right now. But what we can do is, you know, with the 2018 midterms coming up, making sure that the, that the you know, voices of people who are generally unheard, youth, minorities, basically concerned citizens, making sure that they're registered to vote and putting our voices out there. So not only have we had, like, 
voting registration ideas, uh, voting registration implementations, actually not only at Rock Canyon, but other schools. We're also trying to use technology, so spreading, uh, spreading the word through like all these social media platforms that we all have. And you know, you identifying hotspots in which, you know, again, using that data analytics to identify hotspots in which, you know, there aren't a lot of voter re voters re being registered. Let's go there. You know, this is another area th where I think that people can g be registered to vote. So I think th th those are the main ideas. Um, again, it's all about understanding our limitations too. But, you know, again, voting and, you know, alerting senators, calling them and telling us, telling them about what we, we, we sh why we shouldn't have that, I think is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. You know, how do we define these data points? You know, that are not necessarily black or white. They're gray. They're not necessarily quantifiable. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is, you know, a naive Bayesian classifier, for example, is basically giving a yes or no statement for each data point. So you can have a 30 field of arrays asking is the target motive related to a hate crime? Yes or no? Is the target motive related to, because it says yes or no, you go on the decision tree. Is the target motive, because it said no to that, is it related to you know, bullying or a school, like, uh, or isolation? Yes or no? Say no to there. Is the target motive related to a workplace incident or employee disgruntlement? Yes or no? So because of, you know, one of the biggest things AI can do is parse these really big descriptors and put them into language that the computer can understand. So although we have to manually go in and say yes or no, you know, we try our best to identify socioeconomic status, you know, poor, rich, middle income, and, if, and then you look on the decision tree, not only poor, rich, but like, you know, what, what's the income bracket? Or you look at, you know, type of firearm, you know, AR-15, yes or no? Is it pistol, yes or no? So there's a lot of decision trees and analytics that we can go behind into providing these, making these descriptors understandable for a computer. And you know, it doesn't all necessarily have to be quantifiable. It's not only number of victims, but you know, you can use true or false statements to dictate some of these. That being said, it is kind of hard. it is definitely an obstacle to overcome, because as much as you want to really really make it like um, as accurate as possible. There are still so many incidents, you know, in relation to Columbine, you have to, we have to look through the diaries of the shooters. We have to see what the victims thought, what the victim relation was to the shooter itself. So, you know, it, it is hard, but we're trying, we're thinking once we have this basic Bayesian classifier running, we can then use like, we can use a, um, <laughs> I forgot the name, <laughs> it's all there. We can use, a uh, Decision, it's not a decision tree, but basically we can use this, use another AI algorithm to refine our technique. So, and one of the biggest things is, you know, we just have to make sure that we're really understanding all facets of uh, this, of this, of these instances. So, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process, but to like genuinely put it in a statement, there are algorithms out there do where that we're implementing right now, but we can definitely refine them to really get the full perspective. The Dickey Amendment, yeah. Are you hoping with numbering and the fact that they kind of reverse that to like make them better, get people to make them more better sentencing and better on putting pressure on people, they can kind of be dominant and flip to like something like numbering and that and then, you know, work on that. Kind of a better situation than solving this particular issue. Yeah, so just to repeat the question, can we use some of the federal funds that we're using towards some of these uh, of these like you know implementations like arming you know st uh, st uh, arming teachers can use it towards one of the, like a cause like this and you know that is one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing because because it's so inherently political 
you know, people automatically assume Never Again Tech is all about restricting access to guns completely, or, you know, completely prohibiting any kind of, like, freedom in this area. And, you know, that thereby it kind of puts off some people. So we decided to take a different approach, you know, because some of the people in the government right now, uh, both locally and on a federal level, are really rigid about <laughs> such activities, we decided to go a little bit more into venture philanthropy. So the money that, you know, that, that VCs, venture capitalists, are giving out in Silicon Valley towards such, like, startups, we're trying to allocate some of those funds into Never Again Tech. And, you know, it's going to be a while before we can use federal funding, but because it's a volunteer-based organization, a lot of our software is given as grants to us because they want it, like, for example, Splunk wants to give, or is, a, is giving us access to their technology for free because we want to do that. Stanford is a volunteer organization, but it's based on a bunch of research assistants and research professors who have already done some kind of work in it that we're kind of going to try and like, integrate into our research. So short answer, federal funding not yet, Definitely uh, not until we have some different political changes, but we we're going a different path. You know, venture philanthropy, volunteer-based like you know research, and you know at the end of the day, trying to uh, nonprofit grants. Definitely. Yes, exactly. Yeah, definitely. I think that once, you know, these different areas, different people from different areas, especially VC and Silicon Valley, which tends to be very technology driven, I think that it leads to a good, great example for the federal government to get more involved with, you know, let's do, let's put this in gun violence research in, or smash shooting research instead. So I think that's a very great point, And I think that it will fall, uh, the government will follow suit once, once understanding that we have, are getting tangible funding from different organizations that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yep. Um, so you said that sometimes your project can come off as negative for people. Um, we know that right now that seems to be... A little politically, yeah. Yeah, or um, very divisive. Yeah. When you start to talk about this project, I mean, how are people who automatically hear the name Tech and see it's called a tech town, how do you keep the conversation open with them and kind of keep with them on the board? Yeah, and you know, yeah, basically the question is, since it's politically, so politically divisive right now, how do we get people on board with the project? So oftentimes when these articles release, it is a little daunting. I do get a lot of hate comments from alt-right, you know, trolls, and, you know, people saying, you know, you don't even understand what, like, it is like to have a gun. And, you know, I think they come from, with, uh, I think the biggest thing for such an argument is to understand where the other person is coming from. So after getting such, you know, getting such like comments, I decided to put some people on the organization who are traditionally conservative, who are traditionally, you know, to in the right, uh, right area, you know, people who think, you know what, it is okay, like, you know, we believe in having guns. So because we are integrating that mindset too, it's not just like, you know, we're all from the same political mindset, because we're integrating, you know, these are different thoughts, these are different perspectives, I think that, you know, is leading to a lot more prog progress in Never Again Tech. Because as I, like you said, it's, it's really, really hard to see when, you know, I like don't even say one sentence, they're like, oh, you're just trying to do this. Well, that's not true because a lot of people even in our group, in our organization, are from conservative mindsets. You know, have traditionally had guns for like almost all their lives, you know. And there's a great initiative going on where, you know, veterans and other people who are, who are definitely a pro Second Amendment are thinking, you know, how can we, there's a group going on where they're saying, we don't want to use this for bad. We don't want to use this to kill innocent civilians. So partnering with them, you know, making sure that we get their perspectives and, you know, kind of formulating a way to talk to everyone in which it doesn't necessarily automatically, you know, offend one group or the other. So, you know, it definitely is a very, again, like hard process, but again, considering all mindsets, integrating all perspectives is I think a great first step. Great. 
and so the the question is for people who didn't understand you know how can we st how are we doing stem outreach in colorado and you know what are the next steps if there isn't any like actual you know <laughs> obvious statements yet so the National Center for Women in Technology, founded by Lucinda Sanders, was actually created at the University of Colorado Boulder. So this is a huge organization with over 100,000 women from different areas, graduates, undergraduates, high schools. Their Aspirations in Computing Award recognizes teens who are, you know, have an aptitude in technology and leadership, and every year Colorado has the most award winners. You know, Girls Go Cyber Start was another initiative created by, I, I think, the same like, Cyber Patriot branch. Uh, and Colorado is one of the first states to participate in it officially along with Utah, Arizona, Florida, and I think California. So I think that, you know, coming from Colorado, we're small, but we're powerful. You know, we definitely people think associate Colorado with other things, you know, skiing, weed. <laughs> but, <laughs> but one of the biggest things is that, you know, we're, because, you know, all these great initiatives are founded from here, it's uh, attracting a lot of STEM outreach and community. That being said, there's always room for improvement. So I think the next steps is, again, mentioning what I did earlier about you know, internships, you know, having these uh, things. But you know, eventually, with NCWIT, I think that if we start, I think one of the biggest things is involving more minority women, women of color in these areas. So ha um, you know, I want to talk to NCWIT now about you know, how can we do this in inner city areas? How can we involve a National Center for Women in Technology for not even high school girls, you know, but people who, you know, are traditionally like older and, you know, are more minorities? How can we involve them too? Because at the end of the day, this is a communal thing. You know, girls in STEM is not limited to, limited to one demographic or one specific community. So, you know, we take these overarching initiatives and we kind of concentrate them, funnel them into smaller areas where traditionally technology isn't as represented. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> 